Hi everyone, welcome back to Farron and Film, and today I am bringing you my review of the new film, Defoe. The film Defoe is a feature-length biography charting the life and professional career of Jermaine Defoe. The film tells Jermaine's life story to this present day, covering life after professional football and Jermaine's current career as a coach at Tottenham Hotspur Football Club and his ambition to be a top-flight football manager. Defoe will be available in UK cinemas for one night only on the 29th of February and tickets are available at defoethefilm.co.uk. Before we get into my review, here is a trailer for the film. My life was just, it was just all about golf. But when you finish playing and you reflect on everything, I can see it's not just about, you know, football. There's other stuff that's important. Here's Defoe, chance, goal! A dream debut for Jermaine Defoe! Yeah, I strive to see other strikers and see how good they are. And then you train and they start bang, 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 and you're thinking, wow. Listen, I've got to be honest with you, there are times where I thought you could have passed me a hell of a lot more. London. So my mum was, yeah, 17 when she got pregnant. I was still living at home with my parents. I was a baby. So when I was my first Sunday team, we had the best players in East London. And I think about it now, it's like so much pressure. This ain't no normal kid. It just said that Jermaine Defoe was here and we might be able to get him out. It's a bit of a sore point, really. West Ham came in. Charlton claimed the under-16 internationals, poached by the Hammers. I had all rights posted all over the wall. And then, yeah, and I shook his hand, just like a kid. Just wanted to put my boots on. I wanted to show right how good I was. That was the master and the apprentice there, right there. England footballers were becoming massive superstars. Editors realised their private lives suddenly became of interest. Yeah, of course I've hurt people over the years, but no one's perfect. You're young and successful and, you know, single. They build you up and then they knock you down. That's what they were doing there. I think it was just the way he looked at me. It was like, I've never experienced anything like it before. Jermaine said that he was going to come up and see Bradley in hospital. Me just sort of like not trusting people, you're sort of like having a guard up and not connecting and not getting close to people. But then with, with Bradley, all he wanted was to meet me. There's nothing else he wants from me. That's genuine love. Yeah, it's more than just kicking a ball. Okay, so with Defoe, we get a potted history of Defoe's football career mixed in with really random at times anecdotal bits. Some typical sort of character referency type things, going back to him, giving back to the community and all that kind of stuff. And towards the end of the film, it feels like we're just kind of filling time at that point. Now, not much of the drama or the tragedy in the film directly links to or affects or pertains to Jermaine himself. There's nothing sort of physically that he has been through um, that is is signposted in the documentary. Um, there's a lot of stuff on the periphery around him. So things like a young fan's death or the team getting relegated or certain illnesses that might crom crop up in his family. It's, it's quite strange saying that and it's quite strange to sort of watch a documentary where that doesn't necessarily happen because in most documentaries of this ilk, you tend to get some sort of trouble or conflict or ailment that the person who is at the centre of the documentary has to overcome, but we don't necessarily get that with this film. Instead, this is very much a sort of, this is Jermaine Defoe, this is who he is, this is what you know him for, this is his career, this is where we are up to now in his life but then even in the moments where we sort of turn and we get a sense of an expose about to happen so with the things where once he sort of reached a sort of point where he was well known and they were saying that you know he, he's fair game with journalists at that point i thought we were going to get a little bit more expose type stuff but really the, it, it glosses over those rough, rough edges really quite quickly. So even in the moments of he's been a love rat, he's been a cheat, he's been this and that, there's no necessarily, there's no real remorse or regret from him in terms of the talking head that happens. Um, and again, like I say, it glosses over that very, very quickly. There's illness and passing that happens in his family. 
And with the, I mean, with with that being said, everyone everyone deals with stuff like that, and it's it's quite difficult to watch a film where you're beginning to wonder why you're being asked to empathise with somebody in a certain way because of these things. It's difficult to feel emotionally invested because all of this awful stuff happens to so many people who haven't had a documentary made about them, but because he's a name, there's supposedly some sort of elevated sense of concern or empathy for them. And again, this the documentary itself relies far too much on the tragic passing of Bradley Lowry, the young fan who, you know, tragically died, um, to try and elicit some sort of emotional response from us as the audience. And the emotional response, should that happen, should that come and should you watch this and feel that you have an emotional response to it, I think that emotional response comes to Bradley and Bradley's mum, not necessarily Jermaine Defoe. And it, it, again, it sounds awful to say that I feel like the documentary tries to use it as a crutch sometimes in that, yes, it's very clear that Bradley looked up to Jermaine, Jermaine Defoe and that everything that Jermaine did when he met him, that was fantastic. That was great. And fair play to him for doing that. But I think we're, we're ill-suited and ill-directed by this documentary to link the two tragedies to each other. I, I think that's an unfair thing for us as the audience to be put into a position to do. There's a very, very real attempt to position Jermaine Defoe as still very, very crucial and pivotal in the footballing zeitgeist. There's a lot of reminders of who he is. There's a lot of things of like, this is what he's done. This is what he's doing now. These are the good things that he's done in his life and professionally and all that kind of stuff. And maybe that might be a cynical approach on my part, but there are very, very explicit inclusions on things like, I still give back to the community. I still do this. I still do this. I remember where I came from, which I think, to be fair, we expect from documentaries like this. We expect that people are going to go back and show us all these different things. But then there's there's a sort of there's a segment where they make it very clear to include that he learned from Ian Wright, and now in turn Harry Kane, pivotal footballer of the minute, is learning or has learned from Jermaine Defoe. So it's very very signposting to me or very very clear to me that it's trying to signpost that this is the intention of the documentary the intention of the documentary first and foremost is for us to understand that Jermaine Defoe is still part of this zeitgeist don't forget about him don't push him over there don't you know don't sort of pigeonhole him somewhere else he's still very much active in the game um, but taking more of a coaching side, and clearly, it's it's almost like a, um, a vehicle to set up ambition at, at certain points as well. Because even going back to the synopsis that I read earlier, so sentences like covering life after professional football and Jermaine's current career as coach at Tottenham Hotspur Hot 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 Football Club, and his ambition to be a top flight football manager. You don't really see a lot of that in the documentary. You, you you sort of like I said before, you go you go through this sort of potted history of the all the different clubs that he's played in. You know the years come up on the screen in huge white text, um, and we go through his career with him, and then very very sort of abruptly and quickly at the end, he says, "Well, this is the this is the stuff that I'm doing now." And there's there's not really too much that signposts you to him having an ambition to be a top flight manager other than that synopsis. So I think it's a bit of a strange one to, for it to be included there. And considering the variety of sports documentaries that we have, so things like the fly on the wall stuff with Wrexham, Welcome to Wrexham, um, the epic episodic stuff that we got with Beckham on Netflix, and then solo feature films like Bisping, for example, Defoe seems to walk a bit of a line between the latter two in that Defoe is it's a feature film like Bisping, but it feels like it would be better suited to being a one-off special on something like Netflix or something like an Amazon Prime. And I think that is eventually where this is going to find its place. I don't know how many people are going to be rushing out to make sure that they book their tickets for this and to make sure that they go and see it on the 29th of Feb in that one night only screen and at the cinema. I think this is much more suited to be in a 
email in your inbox, Defoe coming soon to Netflix type deal. And even actually, it's an hour and a half long, you know, feature length. I would shave 30 minutes off that and I would stick it in um, a documentary series alongside um, England football players of the time. So people like a Steven Gerrard, a Frank Lampard, a John Terry, a Joe Hart, Jermaine Defoe, there's your five, there's your mini series, put it out there. That's what it feels more akin to and I think would be more comfortably released as. Obviously, that's not what's happening. In a vacuum, do I know more about Jermaine Defoe? Jermaine Defoe? Yes, of course I do. I've, I've watched the documentary. Of course, I know more about him. Was it particularly shocking or interesting? Not entirely, no. There wasn't necessarily anything that I've come out of it and I've sort of had to go to people and go, can you believe that happened to Jermaine Defoe? I didn't realise that happened to Jermaine Defoe. Did you know that happened? It's, it's basically four people who are fans of Jermaine Defoe or who have followed his career, or even people of a similar age to me whose knowledge of him is tied to his appearances in the England squad during our formative years. And they're more likely to get more out of it than I am. I, I don't think it's I don't think it's a crying shame or a surprise to anybody that I'm not a huge football fan. And I think this is necessary this is more so for the football fans, but I would be very, very surprised if anybody said, coming out of it, I know more about the person Jermaine Defoe. Because again, there's not necessarily any rough edges to it. There's not, like everything gets glossed over. And the, the synopsis supposedly sets it up as him showing his ambition to go and be a top flight manager. I didn't necessarily get that from the documentary. That's only in my brain from reading the synopsis. So overall... Like it's it's a well made piece. It's a well made film. It does everything that it, I think it wanted to set out to do. Which again, for me, I feel like the intention of it is that it just wants to position Defoe as very much still in the zeitgeist, and I would say it achieves that. Like I'm not. If someone sort of said to me now, you know, name a footballer, he might be one that pops into my head mainly because of this. But again, I feel like it's one of those things of. Everybody else gets the spotlight. Everybody else gets the the clubs that they go and manage at or the clubs that they go and coach at. And uh, is this a sort of again? I don't like. I feel like I'm being cynical, but is is this sort of a PR thing to make sure that he remains in the zeitgeist? But again, it was it was fine. Like I, it, it wasn't necessarily a thing for me, really. I'd say. Um, so again, that is Defoe. Um, it is available in UK cinemas for one night only on the 29th of February. Tickets are available at defoethefilm.co.uk. It seems to be getting a release in a couple of views and a few audience. When I typed in Manchester into the um, the search, the closest one for me was Odeon Trafford Centre. So again, it's, it's, it's popping up here and there for that one night only on the 29th of Feb. But I feel like it's going to find its home probably on a Prime or a Netflix in, in a very similar format to the way that you've probably already accessed sports documentaries. So again, that is Defoe, available in UK cinemas on the 29th of February, one night only. Tickets available at defoethefilm.co.uk. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I am about to start doing prepping, scripting, recording um, this year's revision podcasts. Um, Manif is coming up soon, so I'm assuming there's going to be a lot of stuff going up about Manif. I'm redoing, going back to the revision podcast, I'm redoing the GCSE timeline because there's been more events added to that for assessment this year. I'm finally going to do the Jojo Rabbit episode to do nothing more than really to, to, to aid my students who study it. Um, and then, yeah, we'll be we'll be going from there. I'll do one for both papers as well. I'll do like a sort of big yearly one as I tend to do. Um, but th that's the sort of next ones in the pipeline. Possibly some top 10 recordings at Easter. But we'll have to see how far we get with that. So again, thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for listening. That was Defoe. Go to defoethefilm.co.uk if you fancy checking it out. Thank you very much for watching again. Stay safe, look after each other, and I will see you next time.